If you have an option as a founder, look for people who are not investing in your company because other people are investing in your company, which is the majority of them, by the way. About probably 80 to 90 percent investors just invest because of the FOMO. Like they don't really believe in the opportunity. They like you know all chasing firm X and partner X is doing doing a term sheet, so I need to do that. And that's how most of the investing world unfortunately works. Welcome to the Logan Bartlett Show. I am your host, Logan Bartlett, and what you're going to hear on this episode is a conversation I had with Jody Bonsell. Jody was the founder and CEO of App Dynamics, which sold in 2017 to Cisco for 3.7 billion dollars right before it went public. We talk about that sale, as well as Jody now running two separate businesses. He is the CEO of Harness, which not coincidentally was most recently valued at $3.7 billion, as well as the CEO of Traceable.ai, which was recently valued at $450 million. In this conversation, Jody and I talk about a bunch of different things related to operating and his different frameworks for making decisions for finding product market fit, hiring executives, firing executives, as well as the saddest day he had running App Dynamics, which was the day he actually sold the business to Cisco. At a big celebration party, and you come home from the celebration party and you're kind of depressed. You know, I was really, really sad when it closed. Really interesting conversation. One of the more thoughtful and tactical leaders that exist in the world of startups. And so hope you enjoy that conversation with Jody here now. And if you're enjoying this show, please do like, share, and subscribe on whatever platform that you're listening to us on. It really does go a long way to helping us continue to grow and have other people find our shows. So without further ado, here's Jody. Jody, thanks for doing this. So I want to get this right. So you're the founder of App Dynamics, sold to Cisco for three point seven billion dollars in 2017. Uh, but today you have three separate jobs ish. So I, I want to get this right. Harness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. traceable, yes, harness. Mm -hmm. and unusual. Mm -hmm. So Harness has about eight hundred people, most recently valued at three point seven billion dollars. Was that? Yeah. That, that couldn't have been an accident. <laughs> yes, you know that's the that was the goal I was shooting for. Yeah, well, the valuations don't mean anything, but still, like you know, you have you know, a good number is a is a good number. You sold AppD yeah. for three point seven, yeah. and know. it was kind of the five year mark of selling AppD, and I wanted to get like you know, that was the goal five year. Let's get let's try to get to the number. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Traceable has about how many people? About one seventy five. One seventy five, and most recently valued at. 450. 450 million. And then Unusual Ventures has a billion under management, roughly? Yeah, about like 1.2 billion. And you, so you're the you're the CEO of the first two, and you're a partner on the third. So you have you have uh, way more jobs than, than most people. How, how do you actually spend your days? Like, how, how do you allocate your time across those different things? Uh, first of all, I don't think of, like, you know, a lot of people ask me this thing. That's probably the number one question. Like, how do you do this, all this? I it's unusual. Really, I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I really don't think in terms of time management. I really think of like, you know, where do I have to make impact? And I even call it like impact management now. So it's like if I'm not making impact, you know, it's not worth spending time on those things. And if you tune for that, like, you know, where impact could be like, you know, if you're spending time, can you move the needle? If you're not spending time, can you move the needle negatively as well, right? So that's both impact on both sides. And I like to maximize most of my time on those. And that can change. Like, you know, that can change because you, we end up spending a lot of time on things that you know, it's not going to move the needle one way or the other. Uh, if I reduce that, then it creates a lot of time, free up a lot of time. Like you're not doing just unnecessary things for the sake of it. Um, but you know, you, obviously, you have some patterns that you have to follow. You know, I follow some like you know, that's the like the regularly scheduled meetings for harness happens on one day, and you know, for traceable happens on one day, and rest are kind of free flowing. So I kind of try to keep like no more than one third of my calendar, which is like just locked up on things. You know, so it's like free flowing and I can figure out what to do. And so does the time end up balancing, I guess, over the course of the year? At any point in time, it might oscillate uh, up or down on mm -hmm. the companies itself. But does it end up being 50-50 over the course of a year? Or some years, is it 30% here, 70% there? You know, I, I don't even you know. You don't even like, know. I don't even know. I don't like to interact like that. Yeah. No, it's, it, I look at, like, you know, are the companies doing well? You know, which are the areas? If, if some area needs a lot of work, like, you know, requires, like, you have to really, really drill down and spend like, you know, 50 hours a week on something, you know, you find time to make that happen. Hmm. You know, if, if you don't have to do that, that's great. Like, you know, but if you just, you have to find time to make forward progress. That's how I look at it. I don't, I don't look back at a year and say, where did I spend my time? It's like, you know, I look back at the year and say, what did we do in the last year? Do you have did overlapping we... investors between the two companies? 
Uh, yes, um, Unusual Ventures is yeah. Uh, so your in venture both. firm invested you know, in both. Uh, yes, and um, uh, one of the firms, IVP, is invested in both. Got but it. Yeah, that's it. Did so. did the other venture investors ask this question, or is it like, hey, you sold a company for three point seven billion dollars, so we're sort of just in the Joti no, Bonds all business? It's, it's a it's a very natural question. Yeah, like, totally. Every, everyone asks me, and and they should ask me, like, how do you how do you do, you know, three different things, and you know, I tell them like, and I would I do it. As long as I think I'm doing a great job at it, you know, or if I think my time is becoming a constraint and doing doing it right, then I will, you know, see that maybe I should not do it. And your time doesn't become constrained if you, you know, look in more in terms of impact and how do you are making the, uh, doing the right things that will change the trajectory of the company in the right way. Second, one is that. Second is you still have to set the tone of the as CEOs of the of the of the business as you are doing that. Are you building the right, you know, bringing the right vision, the right, uh, you know, the alignment across the different leaders that's there? Uh, but I also like to work long hours. You know, it's not uh, for me like 60, 65, maybe 70 hours is, is not, you know, abnormal. If I'm not if not doing that, I feel like I'm slacking that week. Yeah. And but it's my choice. Like, it's not that I have, I'm some anyone is asking me to do it. You know, it's, uh, you know, I don't have. Too much interest in playing golf or like you know doing things that uh, you know this is what I enjoy. When people so give me shit easy. about having a podcast as well, I'm going to point at you yeah. and say like, if this guy can do all of that, then I can do. See, yeah. I can get behind a mic uh, once a week to talk it's to totally, people. Why not? Like you know, it's uh, you, if you are enjoying it, you know, and you can balance it. It's like I look at like we are all smart enough, mature enough at this point, and or these you know when we are in our our careers and lives that we learn how to manage you know different priorities. It's not like, you know, when you have to really, really tightly track your time and figure out the priorities, like, you know, it's, but it's, it's all about prioritization. You're, you're but, assuming uh, a lot uh, in the, that, that I am mature, but I appreciate that sentiment there. <laughs> so, so do you keep, um, I, I'll let this topic go in a second, mm-hmm. but you said you keep about a third of your schedule unbooked mm-hmm. and that's for things as it comes up and kind of mm-hmm. variable things. Are there is there anything else that you do interesting with your I, calendar? Well, I, I like to see, like, you know, you have, like, almost like recurring meetings, like, you know, weekly, sure. you know, executive st- staff meeting, you know, uh, every two weeks, you know, we, in both my companies, we have all hands meetings. Uh, you have, like, you know, one-on-ones, things like that, like, so which are, like, just on the calendar, either once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, once a quarter, whatever it is, right? I like to keep them to fill no more than 35% of my calendar is my normally my rule. So then the rest of the time, you can plan and you can you can adjust on you know what's what you need to do where to make the most impact. You know you obviously need the recurring things to have the cadence in your business. Uh, but what I've seen in many times, like your whole hundred percent of the calendar is filled with just recurring things, but you don't have time to do anything else. So that's that's like I, I like to keep keep simple uh, and kind of make sure like you know I have flexibility. Does that time the the two thirds does that tend to get filled with? other meetings that are sensitive, uh, time sensitive in some way, or does it tend to get filled with deep thought and stuff for you to, where you can make the biggest impact? Or is it, yeah, it, it am it, I looking for? No, it, it's really depends on what's going on. Yeah. Let's say, you know, I, I like to spend time with customers. So that's like, that's there. Like, and I want to sp- go and meet customers. Uh, I like to spend time like recruiting and like, say sometimes you're recruiting for some key hire, you know, maybe your whole two weeks are filled, you know, majority of the time you are spending in, uh, in trying to recruit the right person there. Right, so you know, sometimes it's like it might be just deep in the product with the product teams. I, the deep thought of like, and I'm sitting in a cave somewhere and doing deep thought. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> but, a venture that, person. But, but yeah. that happens also sometimes. Like you know, you just want to, you know, put your headphones and uh, you know, and maybe research something and think about something. But that's that's to me is happening. Yeah, yeah. You know, all the time. Yeah. Now. Uh, I talked to one of your investors, Matt Murphy from Menlo, uh, who worked with you as well at App Dynamics, and he said um, he said that you have a number of really interesting frameworks, and he was very complimentary about uh, how you have been able to go about finding product market fit. So I want to ask about that. But one of the things that uh, you did have a, a structured framework that I that I heard you talk about was uh, evaluating opportunities for entrepreneurs. And so I think you said there are three different components in how you thought about it: evaluating the market size, the actual need for the product. Uh, in the market, and then the passion for the opportunity. Can, mm-hmm. can you talk about like that sure. framework and how that ha- how you give that advice to yeah, the founders? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the number one question. Like, you know, people uh, think of a lot of time. Like, I have this idea. Should I quit my job and start a company, or should I start a company about it? And people ask for this thing all the time, right? As an engineer, I like to create frameworks for most things, at least some basic mental frameworks. So that's you have a lot of good ones, by the yeah. way. I'm going to ask you about a bunch <laughs> of them. Right. Yeah. So my framework on this is like I look at like you know first of all you have to look at you know do people care about solving this problem, you know that's like 
is this a real pain that people the world cares about you know second is does, does the world many people in the world care about it or just a small number of people so that's the market uh, you know, size that's, one that's how second, big is this yes. market you know and i look at like let's say someone has an idea that you know i want to build a trampoline for dogs to jump on you know you do people care about it like do, you know maybe some people do like if like 100 people in the world care about it do you really want to start a company on that the third is then you know so you have to really validate that and i look at like you know you have to talk to a lot of people to figure out like you know is it a big problem that a lot of people care about uh is it real real problem that people will pay for solving as solving and then if you figure those two out then you look at like are you really really passionate about this problem yourself and do you, i also th- uh, you know ask people to look at like are do you have some kind of a unique insight expertise something about this the thing, why you that, you know why you part of it because if it's a real problem that the world cares about solving like can you really win in solving this right so then that you know say if you if you want to like if i have to start a company in fashion something you know even though it's some real problem is there that i identify there's very unlikely that i'm going to win i don't really have any unique insight unique expertise unique something so that's maybe you should not start a company there so i, I look at the, the simple test if you can do you know that you pretty convinced that the market is large pretty convinced that the problem is what is like people going to spend money on solving this problem in some some way and you know that you are willing to you know spend a lot of time because you're passionate about this this problem and you have some unique expertise or insight that's a good good thing like then you jump in and start try start the company do you think about if the market is large today or do you pick a point in the future and say hey can this be large if xyz happens it's it's a combination of things i think i do think you know and i i've tried to create a framework around it but didn't really work well on that that topic but still i feel roughly about like i feel like 2 years is about a good you know future reference like where do you think like you know okay it's or if the market is not today if it's it's fine if it's there 2 years from now it's going to be 5 years from now your startup may not survive that 5 yeah. years like you know you have to have in you know, a very very unique spot to have so much capital to survive through that so i'll feel like 2 years is the right if 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 the if the market is right now very very ripe there's high chance you're late you're a bit late you know and so i feel like 2 years is about the right time like you know where the puck is going 2 years from now because you can find the early adopters now if something is going to be like you know ripe and mainstream like 2 years from now there will be good number of early adopters today that is so you go after the early adopters now 2 years from now it starts getting more mainstream you know that's where most people are getting getting to so you're ready to go and capture the mainstream at that point you know that's kind of roughly i i like to to follow the the as, as a rule Now you've you've had to find product market fit a few different times starting a, a few different companies as well as investing and having seen it. How do you think about um what framework you apply to making sure the component outside of the market size. The second one was will the dogs actually eat the dog food, right? Or will the dogs jump on the trampoline to use your example? What's the methodology and process that you go about evaluating this? Product market fit is such a such a vague process like, you know, you ask 10 people there will be 10 definitions to begin with. How do you go to product market fit is really people most of people think it's a, it's just a just a dark art you know so we have tried to create a framework around that and you know i i've brought in my experiences from map dynamics and harness and traceable and you know everything that i've seen and you know it's at unusual what we 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 write a lot about it we have the unusual field guide to talk about it which uh, and to create share the experiences kind of can bring it down into a few areas like which is one is that focus on on real cold outreach to get to the to have real conversations what happens many times is like you know you start as a as a founder you find some friends and family some investors will introduce you you are if you are in place like silicon valley there will be the silicon valley echo chamber you will talk to like you know uh, people you know in silicon valley and you just not hear the right feedback like so if you can find people cold who will be your likely target buyers at some point and they will even take a meeting with you and you can validate something with them you know that's a, that's that's a, that's a good sign so that's what we i would say first part of the framework like you know don't just go in this warm meetings and all i, I remember at you know abdanomics uh, i first started uh, there as one of our investors so let me introduce you to some banks in new york and you know the investor had a few connections there and you know i did a trip trip to wall street you know and uh, this was like company was four people and i did a trip to wall street you know i uh, didn't have any i didn't want to spend any money so you know took up you know changed my shirt and you know washed my face in a starbucks too so that i don't have to pay a hotel room but then i did the whole like i met like seven different banks in 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 one one day like back to back came back like oh great set of meetings you know high fives to to our team like you know we have found the product market fit like have great meetings and then i started following up with those seven people like you know hey we had a great meeting in new york and uh, you know following up on being a beta customer or something no one even responded 
you know and that that clicked to me is like you know that those people took the meeting because you know it was a warm intro they wanted to be nice to the the person making the intro and the meeting was good because they wanted to be nice to me because you know they just if you're a founder who are passionate about your thing they don't want to t- be like you know tell in your face uh, that you know your, your thing is not good or they don't care about your thing or they don't need your thing and since then i realized like you know the best way to get real good feedback is cold like you know you reach out to people cold on linkedin if you're not been getting a response from anyone there's a good chance that like you know no one cares about your problem or like in you know, audio message or what how you said talking about it if people take the cold meeting with you there's a good sign that that means there is a interest in this thing you know if the meetings go well after that where they don't really have an obligation of any kind to be nice to you you know that's a, that's a good sign as well right so that's that's really the first part of it second is you know do a lot of it you know people a lot of people do like you know they talk to three people or five people and you know this one customer we talked to here you know they said this thing and they're excited and ready to go and you know uh, i'd like to tell everyone is like you know you got to look at at least 30 to 50 conversations you know and the conversations to the point where the the test is when you're hearing the same things you know it's the if you start hearing the same things that means you have found the uh, you've done enough conversations that you're not really learning anything new it's the same things again and again and the third is being iterative about this like whenever the first thing you start with like you say this is the problem you're solving this is why our differentiated technology solution to to solve this problem is you know your message and story would not be right the first time like right? so you do five conversations you iterate and do another five and you iterate another five you iterate by the time you are at 40 conversations you kind of figure out the the solution of how you sell it and how you talk about it and do you have the right product market fit or not so i i like to promote that and that's what you know we talk a lot about that on usual well as well which is the this kind of framework of go cold you know in your outreach to a high volume so you're not like biased by a few and it trade quickly on that and then you have like a sort of a good definition of your 40 50 people who are saying the same things you figure out how to like you know talk about this the differentiation the product the you know the pain that's the basis of a good product market fit so you've gone cold to these people you've heard validation of product market mm-hmm. fit being there at least commonalities that they're using the same words mm-hmm. now you start building the product and there's a balance between speed mm-hmm. and product quality and there's a tension between those two how do you think about that now that you've heard this feedback going back to those customers and saying hey we have it what's your framework for making that i think this one a lot comes down to what is the the market right you know if, if you're going in a market where there's no existing incumbent speed is important like you know because the quality bar could be low the, the quality as in like you know the completeness of features etc like you know because it's uh, it's something is better than nothing if there's the nothing, mvp is low it's the MVP minimum is viable low. you know yeah. you, you used to have this uh, whole uh, lean startup thing and people got too crazy on the lean startup thing like you know people would come in like build this thing very lean and then this this thing now look at like, if you're going in a market with a lot of incumbent players or, like strong incumbent players the lean startup thing doesn't work like no one is going to buy your lean mvp and so it's like you know you have to find something that's uh, you know many times it's like you have to get to at least the you know the some kind of parity with the incumbent if you want to go and replace the incumbent and the incumbent has a lot of you know important features you have to go and get parity and then you build the differentiation on top of that right so your mvp definition is very different depends on how strong the incumbents are and so to me it's like you know how what you build out it depends on that like you know it's like if you look at say you know great example was workday you know when uh, workday was starting to like we going to be the saas version of people saas people will replace people saas uh, with workday now if you apply the like you know the, let's start with a very small subset of the people saas features and now no one is going to replace people saas with workday so even your mvp v1 has to have everything the people saas will do and that's the and that's your your differentiation is that your saas people saas was not saas so that's you know but your mvp bar is high so you have to finish that to go and build that market if you're going into a completely new market where there's no one there then yeah you start fast so that's how i would balance it what about in the uh, product development life cycle so now there actually is a product that's out there in the wild and you've you've either gotten it quickly or you've built for a while and and you're trying to take feedback and there's a bunch of different constituents that can give you feedback right there's your own intuition which uh then there's sales people out there talking in the field there's what your engineering team thinks there's what their product team thinks all of them are probably ideally they'd be singing the same tune but probably all have different no, competing they, they, priorities they they are not and they're competing priorities and i would say the 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 product leadership team in a in a startup has to or any company really um, but startup normally the, the the founders and ceos will be the product leaders 
you have to manage that you know actually i've written about this framework in a in a, in a post uh, called the like the, the four lists that someone has to manage the one list is you know what your uh, what your customers are asking for you know and customers are asking for hey i don't have this feature i don't have this feature i can't adopt and if they're unhappy about something they can you know and uh, so you have to to build that list the second list would be what your sales people are saying that you know we don't have this feature we are losing this deal or you know our competitors are are you know are really uh, you know putting things uh, in the market that we can't compete with you know unless we have these things etc so the third list uh, after that is your your kind of like technical debt that builds up over time like you know architectural debt quality debt you know different kind of things which the engineers are asking for hey we need to stop building features and do this otherwise everything will crash or we will have performance issues or we'll have like you know security issues or whatnot right and the fourth list you know which is i call like the 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 kind of your vision list which is like what the what where do you need to grow the the the, the, part, the your time your market your opportunity like the new you know many times when you start to start something anything like you have a big vision and you start with maybe 50 percent of that initially and now you have to build the rest and you know maybe your vision is growing over time as well so that's the fourth list so anytime you almost have to balance the four like you know it's like you know your four list you any let's say you're doing a like a planning for one quarter of engineering work or one sprint of engineering work you pick some things from each of the list and say okay what's the that's your that's that's your 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 plan for this quarter or this sprint and things can change like you know you're losing a lot of customers you know on churn you may have to fill most of your work with the that and if you're losing a lot of deals to customers to competitors because you don't have like one feature that's like a, your competitor is kicking your ass on that one feature you have to you know prioritize that you know but it's normally you want a balance of balance of things around, around those four do you do you actually have those lists written out uh yeah. and you're you're checking them off and i assume some of them double overlap and you're, you're... They, they, yes they do like and you know normally we'll have like you know let's say the feature requests that are coming from customers you know we'll make them like you know as a as a list and these are like you know mechanisms we'll use like you know maybe tags or something like we'll, we'll you can filter in in Jira, and you say, okay, these are the list of all the feature requests coming from customers. You're prioritizing it. The product managers are managing that backlog. You know, you have another list that's coming from like you know sales rep people, not most likely sales engineers who are like you know maintaining a list of the feature gaps you have compared, you know, where you, why you're losing a deal, etc. And then the engineers maintaining their tech. And so these are all like you know uh, the lists are are there very openly for us, you know. And then we kind of manage the the when we plan, we we uh, you know we balance them out. The framework works very well. Like you know, I've been doing it for a, for you know, this kind of thing for a, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Now it's 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 a simple framework, but I do think like you know, having that mindset of like you know, that it's always a balance of those four, and you make a conscious decision on what you're taking from those, and uh, you know, and also like you know, sometimes you're also making conscious decision on where do you spend your your dollars on, right? You know, let's say, you know, the fourth bucket I call the fourth bucket is like the the with your vision kind of bucket is you're also expanding your addressable market, like because if you keep doing what you're doing in the first three buckets. Maybe like you know you're fine for this year, but like you know I, that's that's how you look at like say you're doing five million revenue this year and your plan is to do twenty million next year. That you have to start building towards like do you have enough addressable market and do you have enough like you know you have to expand into adjacent areas for that going from five to twenty. You know so you have to invest into in, into that that far ahead, right? So it's a uh, it's uh, it's 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 key as well. I've heard you say that you structure your teams as startups within startups, and you there's there's some way of operating in which you you assume uh, or that you encourage the team to assume that the other departments aren't actually good at their job and that they need to be the best at what they're doing. Can can you talk about like what a startup within a startup actually means for these different departments? Sure. Two different things. Though. The startup within startup, when I set it up, it's more around the product areas. Like, you know, it's like, say, and I look at, like, you know, most companies will start with, like, one product or one, call it, like, one product, one major use case that you are focused on. You know, and you will start slowing down on your growth if you only do that one. So at some point, you have to go from one to two, so your second product to third product to fourth product. And, like, you know, most of the markets, you have to keep growing into a platform at some point. Like, you know, if you want to be billion-dollar revenue, it's hard to do it without becoming a platform. Uh, but it's very hard to innovate, you know, in the and building a second product successfully or a third product successfully for the companies, and that's where I, I, you know, like this um, kind of a model of a, you know, when you're building a second product, almost start that as a startup inside the company, you know, and what that means is like, you know, when you start your first product as a startup, as a real startup, you normally have a small team, maybe like you know five six engineers working on it, you know, uh, who are very driven about you know uh, making finding the product market fit building moving things moving fast you know they're not uh, slowed down by processes and the you know the, the burden that comes with, with 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 it so when you're building a second product you want to do the same thing 
you know, which is not normally not what, what normally happens. Like, you know, if you have, your first product is mature and selling and, you know, you, so you at that time you have to mature your processes on quality and how you do engineering and how you talk to customers and you have like, you know, how you sell it. All of those are like, you know, we're designed for that mature scale. And now you try to build the same things on your product number two, it just fails. Like, so I like to do like, you know, product number two, build exactly, go back to exactly how you build your product number one successfully. And it should not be any different. You know, when you build your product number three, it's the same same kind of thing, right? So, so I, I like to structure these when you build new products into like a sort of a small startup inside the company. And even the funding model is very similar to a startup. Like, you know, when we look at like, you know, let's say when you're building the, you're, you're starting building the product, you normally need like five, six engineers. And once you start getting to, let's say, you know, call it the, the seed stage startup, for, right? And when you start getting to like, say half a million, a million of kind of revenue, then you kind of grow that to, you know, 10, 15 engineers. You know, when you start getting to, you know, maybe three to five million of revenue in that, then you start growing it to like, you know, 20, 25 people, you know, in, in that that product kind of startup. When you start growing it from like, you know, maybe 10, 15 million revenue, then you put it to like 30, 40 engineers. And some point it starts like you don't need it. So, but you, you can even tie your investment not too different than like how the, 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 the venture kind of investment work. And to me, that model has worked so well. Like at Dynamics, we started with one product. And we grew for to like you know by the time we were you know we were going IPO and all that we were we were about nine products at that time, and you know that was why we were growing so fast. We were growing like almost business was almost doubling at that time because the nine products we were able to build. At Harness, I kind of brought in the same model and tried to to kind of do a even more mature version of that startup within startup model, of like how we go from one product to to much more. Like you know Harness, we we are in the DevOps uh, uh, platform space and we started with one product, continuous delivery. And just in a few years, we have expanded into like, you know, we have eight products in the market who are really strong and competitive to the best in class players there. And people really ask like, how do you build all these things? Like, you know, you have CD and you have, you know, CI and feature flags and cloud cost management. And so many, where there are separate startups that compete in all of these markets because of the startup within startup model that, that kind of, that we have been able, able to do. So that's the, that's the startup within startup concept, which I really like that, you know, it allows to scale. And to me, the inspiration always been Amazon on this. Like, and Amazon has done a, like how Amazon became Amazon is this fundamentally a model like this. Like that's how they have, you know, gone from like you know one product to second to third to like you know what they have gone into into all these different markets and build build amazing uh, you know products in these markets. So it's kind of a similarish concept in the B two B kind of world that 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 we bring in. Your second question was about like you know I think I talked about this uh, at some point where. Um, I want every department to be, you know, excellent on its own. You know, it's like I call it like the what's the competitive advantage? Like you know, some companies have that your competitive advan- advantage is your how you do engineering, that you do engineering so well that you know it's hard for that becomes your competitive advantage. Some companies have like you know sales is your competitive advantage, like they do, sa- you know, the sales execution is so strong and that's your competitive advantage. You know, and people even say that like you know the the, the companies with engineering as a competitive advantage like. Our product is so good; it sells by itself. We don't need sales and marketing people. <laughs> and the, the sales, sometimes the sales people, with, comes from really good sales environments, right? They will say, you know, uh, we had the fourth best product in our in our space, but our sales was so good, we still beat everyone because, you know, we are so good sellers, we can sell even a like a comb to a bald guy kind of thing, right? So I start to like, you know, like why not just have that as a mindset then, right? You know, which is not a mindset. So to engineers, I like to say like, let's build a product that, you know, we can, you know. That is so good that we don't need the best sellers. And to the sales guys, I tell them like, you know, let's bring the best sales execution like that you don't need the best product. You know, so we have both as a competitive advantage. And the other one I also look at is like is customer success. Like, you know, can you make customer success as a competitive advantage that your customers are saying, hey, these guys are so good in supporting the customer that we want to buy from, you know, that. And then I've seen that it's a competitive, like, you know, becomes a competitive advantage as well. You can have your marketing brand as a competitive advantage as well. So I like to say, like, you know, if you if you have one competitive advantage that your product is great, but other threes are, are not, that's still fine. But you get two or three as competitive advantage that buy on it on their own, they are they are a big competitive strength and advantage. Why not? And then you combine them, then it becomes like you know, real really powerful. Before founding App Dynamics, you were a engineer at Wiley, mm-hmm. which was kind of a V1 and to, to App Dynamics's cloud uh, version of the product. Um, and you went from that to CEO of a 
how many people did app do you have uh about 1500 1500 so, so you scales along the way um i'd be interested in that path mm -hmm. and uh going from figuring out how to manage all these people and all that but one of the things on the journey that i thought was particularly unusual that that you've alluded to is you really found religion on sales and enterprise sales and even at the beginning when i asked you how you spend your time you talked about meeting customers and recruiting which are both sales was there a mentor or someone that sort of t taught you that path or did you just figure out this was something you needed to become best in breed because especially at the time you were doing this 2008 9 10 uh, there was all the mm -hmm. no salespeople optimizely mm -hmm. mindset of let the mm -hmm. product sell itself we'll never need salespeople yeah. again you know, first of all let me uh, you know let me correct on the where i spend my time the core of it i'm a product guy so the where i like to spend the most of my time is product yeah. you know it's like um, so customers recruiting you know can take a lot of time which is great uh, but I, where I run most of my time is product. And actually in most of my companies, I'm the chief product officer as well. Like, I'm, you know, Abdanamics, I was the chief product officer. I don't hire chief product officer because that's my, I consider that's my job and that's my strength. And same in Harness, like, you know, I'm the chief product officer. I run the, the product myself, like the product teams, to, you know, uh, I don't have a senior level uh, product leader because of that. And that's where a majority of my time goes. So that's, you know, that's yeah. one to, to, yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. to correct yeah, that. Yeah. But you can't build, build, you know, great products without talking to customers, especially in our kind of space where the, the, the B2B kind of enterprise uh, kind of space. So that's why you have to spend a lot of time with, with, with customers there. But being a product guy, you know, that's where the challenge is like, and how do you find religion in sales as well, right? So at, I'll tell you, like at Abdanomics, you are about, um, our product was very strong. You know, we are the best product in the market. You know, we are so we are we are we are growing rapidly. You know, we are about like you know grew from the, the just launched the company. We were in uh, maybe seven eight million of ARR, uh, uh, grow, growing fast there. And I met with Dave David Ticheria, who's the you know uh, CEO at MongoDB now. He was he was uh, uh, let's say trying to figure out what to do at that point. Uh, you know, uh, 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 he was just he just left BMC at that time. And I met him for breakfast, and we were talking about this like you know that our product is doing so well. And I was also in this thing of like, you know, the product, it's all about the, the, the great product, which I, you know, that's my strength, my that's my superpower is. And that we had all these advantages in our product. And they was like, you know, that's this is all great, but you know what, imagine like, you know, what you, if you have the similar kind of advantages on the sales execution as well. And then if you can combine the two, and you know, that's that's really what started me, uh, you know, getting, uh, started me on that kind of journey on like, you know, can you combine a great product with a great sales execution? You know that what happens at that point. That was his, his, his challenge to me. Like you know, can you combine the two? Like you know, you have a great product combined with great sales execution. Then I met with uh, John McMahon uh, right after. John McMahon, as many of your the, the, you know listeners and all will know, is uh, it's kind of the legend in the enterprise selling world. Uh, um, you know, it, it came from this company PTC, which became a legendary company on how the sales. You know, sales was done in a very scientific way. Um, and uh, so, you know, he became an advisor to, to AppDynamics. And I learned a lot from him, you know, on what does, you know, selling means. You know, when I started as an engineer, I thought selling was like, you know, slick guys with like slick hair, whining and dining and playing golf. And that's the only way you do sell sales. You know, it was kind of this kind of a, almost like a black art. And which, by the way, most people still think that's how it is which really is not the case, you know? So that's what, you know, uh, spending time with the likes of like likes of, of John McMahon, you know, you start learning the, there's a science behind enterprise sales. Like, you know, the science of like, you know, the, how it's all works, like how can you do it in a repeatable, scalable kind of way? And that really fascinated me. Like, you know, that's, uh, that, that you, then you don't have this like, you know, uh, you know, product I know how to, how to build the great products, you know, but I almost felt like, you know, this is black art of selling, you know, after that. And the only way you do that is, is product-led growth, etc. which is what, you know, what we're doing at AppDynamics early on. And then we tried, then once I learned that, you know, sales could also be more predictable and manageable and have a, there could be a science behind sales, the, you know, I just got very fascinated about it. Like that, if you combine the two, then you get the best, uh, you know, best, uh, best opportunity there. That's what we ended up building at AppDynamics. And, you know, that's how I look at, you know, Harness, that we have ended up, we have built it, built that's all we are starting to build a traceable too. It's, a, it's amazing the McMahon tree that permeates uh, Silicon Valley at this point, the number of yeah, great companies yeah, that have yeah. sort of grown up under his mm -hmm. tutelage. What, um, if, if, if you're a first time founder or a young founder that comes out of technical background, product oriented and that, it, were there any, any lessons in particular that you have about 
thinking and even approaching understanding sales. Uh, you mentioned the architecture point and that there's actually methodology behind it. But I- any interesting things that you learned along the way that that might be um, helpful to someone that's kind of first broaching this topic? I think the, the, the number one, if like someone is new to understanding this, is sales is a numbers game. That really is the foundation of everything scientific about sales that it's really a numbers game that you want to manage in the right way, which is like, you know, if you want to have a million dollars of business, yeah, you, how many, you know, um, you know, sales opportunities you need to have, you need to have maybe three to $4 million of sales opportunity. What does an opportunity mean that, you know, that it will convert like, from three to $4 million to a million dollar? What's the definition of it? You know, so that's becomes a qualification and all that criteria, right? So you have a, a predictable rate of conversion from a numbers game from stage one to you know some stage to the final stage, you know to get to a sales opportunity, how many meetings you need to to do, you know, and it's 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 eye opening for many first time you know uh, um, engineer turned uh, founder CEOs, and it was eye opening for me like you know like to to get one customer when I, when you realize okay to get one customer we need to have about about you know uh, somewhere around fifteen to twenty meetings. And then you realize, like you know, that we are like obsessing with every meeting, which is good, which is good. But really, it's the numbers game of like you know, that I need to build the machine that I need fifteen to twenty meetings. You know, the fifteen to twenty meetings will convert to like you know maybe five to you know uh, five five six be you know uh, qualified sales opportunities that will get me like you know two or three you know close deals there something like that, right? But that just realization that it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a funnel with a with a numbers game and what you need to do is to manage the size of the funnel right like at every place but also the the conversion rates at every place right and tune them in the right place that's that's the you know i would say the the primary sh- first time learning on the from an engineer to uh you know to to have around sales what about scaling as a leader so you 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 grew um from just yourself as a solo founder uh which i want to ask about but then uh leading a a very big team um what were some of the lessons about hiring people along the way like different executives you brought in different team members uh, that you had from the app d journey and then that you brought over to harness you learn as you as, as you go right you know uh, a lot of times people think like you know the answers are all figured out like first time founders i tell them all the time like it's uh, it's it, there's no point trying to learn everything you know upfront you know focus on what you need to do for the next 12 to 18 months and just try to learn that like this just silicon valley and the whole tech world is so bombarded by so much advice by the way and the advice some guys be, even can, have podcasts for yes it, you know, know or yeah, like yeah. some guys who come and talk on yeah, podcasts yeah, and give exactly. advice which like you know yeah I look at sometimes that advice could be overwhelming and and too much. Like so, you really focus on what so I, the way I like to think of is like you know, what you need to achieve in the next twelve to eighteen months. Like the next major milestone, what you need to learn in that for that, right? So you learn in that, and then you as you go, you achieve that, and you don't think about the what beyond that too much, and then you go to the next one and you learn there. So same it, when growing as an engineer turned first time founder. To like managing the business, that's kind of how I look at it. Like when I just first starting, like what was the the, the success criteria for me for the very beginning was like raise capital, uh, and you know hire an initial team of maybe five seven people, uh, and build a good product market fit. So when I look at like you know hiring team and learning skills for myself as well, it really came down to those three. Like you know I I never raised capital before. Can I f- learn how to raise capital to get the company going? You know, uh, I actually never recruited before. So can I convince like five, seven engineers, good engineers to come and join me in, as there? And then can I f- find product market fit? And do I need people to help me through the, through either either of those three? Right. So that's your ex- your journey to building the team. Now you achieve that milestone, let's say, right? You know, which is like, say, a year, 18 months later. Now your next milestone is in early sales. Like, you know, that you need to find people to do, you know, you, you have to, as a company, you have to get to the first million or two of sales and get the you know, the, the close your first deals, maybe launch a company out of stealth. So you need some marketing expertise you, to, to launch the company, get the messaging and positioning right. You need to have like the sales expertise to get that early sales going to, you know. So you need to find the people with those skills and you have to learn some of those skills, so, you know, into some level as well. Then you start getting the next stage, like, you know, okay, now you are, you know, you have to start scaling your sales. Where like, you know, you can't just have the founders with a few sales people, you know, selling. Uh, you know, to have us, it's now you need to find people who are good in those skills, like, you know, how do you build a scalable sales organization? How do you do demand generation in a scalable way? You know, how do you do customer support in a scalable way? 
your engineering engineering team is growing so how can you do like you know more structured engineering you know at a you know at, at a scale so now you start bringing those leaders and you learn how to manage them like and then you go to the next level and now it's like you know about scaling even more and like you're running at like where it's not just one level of management you have like two three levels of management what do you need to learn on that you keep start getting closer to an ipo it becomes a lot about financial management and financial tuning and you know the 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 you know uh, so it's all different skills and i look at like you know it's best just to just go as you you know uh, and go deep into that particular skill area and bring the right people on hiring you know who are very good on those like you know so at any stage you want to partner and bring the right people you know who some you can learn from also and you know you who can who have done some of those things before so you are you know as a, as a founder you you, are, you it becomes easier for you uh, i always look at like you know the areas where i don't know too much i need to hire someone who's who's extremely experienced and who has done that that kind of job before in areas where i know a lot maybe i can hire someone who's not done that job before and is still fine like i'll still feel comfortable so that's how i uh, that's a framework i kind of done it was i did at app dynamics like and i never did sales before so the first time i wanted to like many people were like just hire a sales rep or two or three sales reps right and i was like if i can the i don't even know how to interview the sales reps and i don't even know how to manage them like you know so can i hire someone who has done that before and like you know so i can learn and they know how to hire sales reps and they have more experience i don't need to teach them you know or i don't need to manage them uh, in in a in in high amount of detail because i don't even know how to manage them right so then i you know bring a vp of sales who knows how to do that and then it becomes easier and then you learn from them as you go right so then you can improve at some point you know maybe now you can do sales better right in the interview process as well, you, you had said that you, you'll use that as a learning opportunity. And so maybe use VP of sales as an example or VP of marketing or something. How do you go about using, if that role exists, using that as an opportunity to really learn uh, and get better yourself yeah, yeah. at it? You know, interviews are great. You know, it's almost like a, uh, like a hack to learn about something. You know, say, let's say you want to figure out, like, if you want to hire a I'll make up a VP of uh, demand generation on for for your company, and you have no idea like what what really to 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 have it to look for, right? You know, we are uh, so let's say you start interviewing people. You know, people will come in and you ask them, hey, how would you? This is where we are. Like you know, right now we are at five million of revenue, and we want to grow to you know fifty million of revenue over the next uh, this year. These are our constraints. We are not getting enough demand from here. Our product like is this our competitors are like this you know how would you build a demand generation program for 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 for, for our business to solve these problems and what's your experience of like you know success or failure of similar situations before that you know of right and someone who's who has done that before they will tell you like you know okay this is what you know your plan you know if i was in this this role this is the plan i would i would build this is what i would do and they will can also tell you like you know we tried these things in my last job here this worked well and this job didn't work well and I've done this before where what the learnings are and now you have that conversation for like you know with someone and you do with like you know if you do with like five to ten people it's you will learn a lot like you'll know like okay what is the right you know plan for you your company probably like you know it's almost like the you know the what I was talking about the product market fit like you know at some point it, the conversations start become sound sounding the same same thing on this as well like you know because you will start learning in the interview process and then you can start the for asking the next level of questions you know and then you know you know like uh, what your plan should be and who is the right kind of person for your company as well right so i i, have, I find interview process quite uh, quite a good you know, it's, it's a good hack to, to learn about, about something. It sounds like it depends on the functional role that you would do this, but how do you think about hiring someone that's been there, done that? Uh, because uh, inevitably, if they're willing to join your company mm -hmm. and they've been there, done that, there, there needs to be a reason that mm -hmm. they would go to theoretically an earlier stage business to go do it versus taking a chance on someone that can be in their ascendancy of their career mm -hmm. who is very high potential and so which one of those did you orient more towards um you know it's uh it's 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 uh it's normally my teams have been a balance of the two like half the teams would be on the you know young upcomers you know you take a chance on them and you kind of build on that and half the team is very experienced people and so it really depends on the person and you know i normally would say i really like to take chance on 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 people who are who, who are who are earlier but at the same time, I do think like you know, if every function in your company is at the, is is kind of like the same, you're taking some risk of lack of experience uh, in, in in the organization. 
so you have to kind of balance the team out you know it's the on how your executive team is like you know in some functions it's a good you know good seniority and been there done there and yes it's hard to recruit like you know been there uh, done there people if you're earlier you know in, but man that's the beauty of the the startup economics and the startup world like you know and the startup people like you know people who do want to come in earlier stages you know they who want to build you know they like the they like the building like you know and you want those people you want like you know that someone who has uh, and maybe they've not gone like you know let's say you're bringing someone someone who has gone from a you know 3 million to 25 million uh, journey of a startup and you know not, now maybe they want to go from you know 10 million to 75 million journey of you know this time but they like that build up the journey the hyperscale those are the people you want to bring ideally right and but it's good that they have seen some of that you know what happens as you grow and maybe they've not gone to the stage that we want to get and go this time but it's it's still those learnings are pretty powerful i heard you say that culture fit wasn't something that you hire for um why why is that the case i find the concept of culture fit very strange like it's the the way i look at it is like you know so you're hiring someone from google a very different culture you're hiring someone from apple as a strong culture you're hiring someone from amazon as a different culture now if you ask them like you know to assess the culture fit by you know tell me how you did xyz in your current job and they if they're working at amazon they will tell you you know this is how you do things they're working at you know apple they will tell you in a different way what they because that's how the company cultures are so it's really a judgment on the person on the culture on like how they operate you know it's not really so i the way i look at them is like you know you know my company has a culture harness has a culture traceable has a culture app dynamics has a culture can this person fit in our culture which is very different than like you know a lot of the culture fit is all, all about like you know so i look at like you know can we teach them our you know you know so we focus a lot on like teaching our culture instead of like you know uh instead of trying to figure out the fit etc like you know it's if someone joins apple they will learn how to operate in apple culture are they a fit there at the time they joined probably not but if they're not willing to change how they operate that's probably is a bigger problem you know if someone joins joins amazon they will operate in a very different way than they they join apple so i look at like can we teach people to operate in our in in our culture can we be deliberate about defining what our culture is you know and can we create a deliberate framework around around that and so to me is more about like can people go and learn our culture less about like you know what culture how they operate and most of the culture fit then ends up about like you know is this a you know you know uh is this a person you want to grab a beer with which is an important thing but the problem with that is like you know that creates a lot of the the, the kind of the lack of diversity you know you know everyone starts you know uh looking and feeling and talking the same and that's why i don't really think about too much about you know it's like testing for culture fit you know i look for like you know hire the right people you know who are coachable you know who are you know who are um, you know s- smart and coachable is 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 what we look for and then we coach them our culture you know but that's you know and that's that's it can you assess that in an interview process or do you need to do reference calls to figure that type of thing out most of the times you can do interview process you know if you have a interview process done with multiple people in the interview panel the right kind of ways uh you can the smart part is like you know a lot of it is like you know what they have done before uh is will but how you how you ask like multiple levels of questions in an in an in an interview on you know do they really have the depth in what they're talking about you know they have the really you know push the boundaries of something to solve like some harder pro- hard problems so that's you you look for in that you know like you have like you know if you have four smart people interviewing someone and they all say okay this guy is pretty smart there's a reasonable chance that that guy is pretty smart mm-hmm. <laughs> the guy or 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 girl uh you know and you have like you know now it's the same thing applies to the the coachable part coachable part i like to look at like you know throw them different things and you know see are they flexible like they intellectually flexible on on new things and learning and you know how fast learner they are and how they like to learn new things etc so you can make that as part of your your you know interview process etc mm. uh references are important for some roles references are pretty important but you know it's hard to do references on for every role yeah second is i feel like most of the references are kind of bullshit you know it's like people don't say bad things you know you have to find the right references uh you know i feel like you know many times instead of doing the reference call you can you can achieve everything from the reference by just having a list of references if someone can't give you a good list of references from their prior bosses etc that's like you know that's a problem if they give you a good list of references you probably don't need to do the call because you kind of know like you know if these people are willing to be this person's reference 
they you know that's all all good all good there the flip side of hiring which you've done a lot of is firing um what have you learned about letting people go um that you might want to impart on founders or operators yeah you know that's always the hardest thing to learn for any any um any ceo or any leader um but that's 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 probably the single most important decision you have to make most of the times First of all, like, you know, hiring is not accurate all the time. Like, you know, whatever you do in the hiring process, you know, you're not going to get, like, let's say, 8 out of 10 right. So now you have your 2 out of 10 that are not right, you know. It's, and now how long you stay with them, that's a, that becomes a important question. You know, I, I like the, the simple rule of, like, you know, if you, if you are, again, going to a framework, <laughs> when my framework is, if I'm defending someone f- fourth time, there's a problem. Like when someone comes to me and say, okay, you know, this this person is not working out and, you know, we have we made a mistake. Like, you know, especially if you're a culture which is of openness, transparency, et cetera, right? Then, you know, and someone comes and like tells you, like, you know, we have a, we made a mistake on hiring, like this person is not doing a good job here, whatever it is, right? And I'm defending them and, you know, that's that's that is fine. But if I'm defending second time, third time, by the time it's fourth time, I know it's it's uh, it's 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 a hiring mistake there that I have to defend whatever that that is and you know obviously i'm taking those first three as a feedback and uh, you know and uh, as a as a coaching opportunity for the you know for for that person so that they have the opportunity but if they can't get there that's a that's a that's a that's a sign that you know you have to make make a change but you can figure that out you know i think the harder ones are when you have to when someone has worked well in the past and you have to remove you know them that's those are even harder because then um and those require even more thoughtful thinking. Right? In the early days of AppD, I, I had heard you say you weren't great at fundraising, uh, but now if you look, uh, you've you've done a fantastic job of fundraising with Traceable and Harness. And what what have you learned about the process of fundraising, and maybe even sitting on the venture side of the table sometimes about mm-hmm. selling a compelling vision and getting investors excited about the story. Yeah, you know, it's it's kind of funny. Like you know, at AppDynamics, I had to pitch, uh, pitch almost like you know, thirty, thirty-five uh, uh, investors, and got a lot of like thirty-plus rejections before I got the first term sheet. When I starting was 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 starting Harness, you know, I had like thirty, thirty-five investors pitching me, and and like you know, giving me offers. Right, so that's yes, that definitely advantage of the of being a second time founder so it's not just like you know that i've become so much good at fundraising yeah uh but you're I've smarter been... you're funnier everyone, <laughs> yeah everyone, all the above yeah, everyone, you know they're just throwing I, money at you when i was doing those 30 35 rejections at, at fd you know what i learned was a lot of it comes down to like you know the right right story on fundraising and the right story is is, is uh storytelling uh that you have to do as a founder and the, the three things about the storytelling that you have to do right one is the why is this a big opportunity? Because the, the the whole VC model and you know works in big bets, like you know, and you have you need the big hits. And so if a, if a company is going to be successful, the chances are pretty low that most companies are going to be successful. But if company is successful, that it's going to be pretty big. That it's going to be you know used to be billion was a big deal, and now it's like maybe more 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 than that. But let's yeah, it say might be a, back to a billion. Uh, yeah, <laughs> might be back to a billion now. So yeah. let's say like you know, would this be a billion dollar uh, you know company or not? So you have to paint that that story well. You know, if you're not painting that bigger story, and you know, that's a, that that makes it hard. Second is you have to uh, paint the story of evidence. You know, a lot of it's like you know, every you can paint the story of this is going to be big, but if you know evidence, that's a that's a that going to be hard to sell. And the evidence comes from you know either you have a product in the market already and you're showing traction, you know, or you have like you know uh, you have a lot of customer interviews and you can talk uh, talk from that. You know, or you have the, you know, um, you know, you have like some cases like report and analysts and industry experts, you know, uh, creating that evidence. Most of the times you have a, some product with some traction is the best evidence, right? Uh, and the third is the, now it's, it's about you, right? You have to sell you, like why you, right? Because any, any company you start, you know, you have to compete and you have to make the point like, you know, why you are the right founder or founders or the team to bet on, why you would be the winners in, 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 in that particular particular space. If you get those three, the, your business does become become pretty pretty fundable. So when you know, you know, I when I was getting all these rejections at Abdanomics, right, I was asking people, okay, what's uh, <laughs> why? I think why are you rejecting? And you know, most of the times VCs won't tell you why. You know, but but let's say some some are good and they will tell you like in an honest way why. And then you start learning from that. You know, someone's like market is not large enough. 
I will hear that story quite a lot where like, you know, at this time, this was like, you know, application monitoring. It's application monitoring, that's such a small niche market. Like this is not like now where you have AppDynamics and New Relic and Dynatrace and Datadog and like, you know, observability monitoring, like, you know, multiple, you know, companies with like billions and billions of valuation. Uh, so market market was small wasn't the number one objection I would get. And, you know, at some point I had to start, you know, and I, was, I realized that I'm not doing a good job in telling like the monitoring does seem like a small niche market. But you have like, you know, everyone building so much code in the world. And it's so painful to, to monitor and troubleshoot and fix when the problems happen in the code. And, you know, to, to tell the story, you have to tell like, you know, how many developers are there, you know, and how many like, you know, uh, application servers or, you know, are being uh, installed and, you know, how much money being spent when something is slows down and why this could be a very large opportunity. But it was not very evident that application monitoring was a large opportunity at that time. You know, so that's something you had to, I had to become good at selling. Second was like, you know, um, was not evident was the, you know, the, the the evidence around it. Like, you know, how do you prove it? Like that it's going to be a large opportunity. How do you prove a differentiating kind of things? So I ended up then like, you know, doing a lot of the cold calling uh, kind of the customer conversations to create that, you know, that, that compelling uh, evidence around it. Because I didn't have a product to show, you know, and I didn't have traction to show. It was like, you know, in those days it was hard to, you know, build the product without any, especially products like that without any revenue. The third was the, the, I have to sell my story, which was pretty hard for me to sell because I was like a first time engineer turned founder. I didn't have too much experience, but still had that experience in the domain. I had like a lot of patents in that area, you know, uh, you know, so, but that's, I had to paint the right, right story, right, craft the right story. Obviously, when you become like, you know, more successful in one thing, then you maybe have, you can go you know, easy on the other other two areas. Right? You wrote a blog post in 2017 uh, that we can link in the show notes, but it's about pitching the venture capitalists to work with. And I'm going to read back the points to you, and I would love to get you to elaborate on this framework. Um, so the first one was reach the highest tier of VC firm you can, but don't go overboard comparing firms. Can, can you talk about what you were thinking in that and in the perspective there? It's a blog from from back in the past before I became a VC, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, so now, now did it would be call me first and then, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, the right VC me and yeah, uh, yeah. from, yes. Uh, I would say what I meant was like, you know, a lot of times people are like, you know, I'm getting, uh, like founders are figuring out, like, I have offers on three firms and I want to, f you know, figure out whom. And many times it's like, you know, this firm is higher in the ranking than this firm, so I need to go there. Like, it's, it, and I would like, I, I try to tell founders it doesn't really matter. Like, you just, you definitely want to get into the, like, these that you are, you have investors from tier one firms, that's a good validation. That's like, you know, obviously they're, those firms are tier one for a reason. But they're all kind of the same at, at some level. Like, you know, it's the, and once you are in that, that tier. And like, you know, if you look at like the, and people go very overboard on like, you know, this ranking said this and was this firm is, is higher there and this firm is this and this is the number one firm and this number two and this number three. Are, and so my guidance is like, you know, look for just that you are in that, you know, you can attract the, the highest tier possible. And then after that, that becomes a material like what, which firm it is. And then the second point was it's, what really matters is the partner. Yes. That's the second point. Like what matters is the partner? Because partner is where you will spend so much time. Like if you're building a company, you probably the partner will be deeply involved in your company for five years, 10 years, you know, uh, uh, could be longer even these days. And it's hard uh, to unwind. Uh, it's, yes, it's like, you know, it's pretty much impossible to unwind, right, you know. Uh, divorces uh, happen all the time. Divorces <laughs> from partners are really hard. Yes, you know, divorces are, are, are much easier compared to yes. divorcing your VC partner in your board. And it, the VC partner in the board, if it's, an, it's not the right person, then it will create so much, uh, so much friction down the line. And many times people are like, you know, I see founders are like, you know, I'm picking this firm over this firm. But it's okay, who is the partner that you be Like once the, it doesn't really matter which firm at some point, the partner will be more important in, in, in your journey. Yeah, look for believers. That's an important point, you know. You know, the, the, the nature of VC business, I think like about probably 80 to 90% investors just invest because of the FOMO. Like they don't really believe in the opportunity. They're like, you know, all chasing, oh, Firm X and Partner X is doing doing a term sheet, so I need to do that, and that's how most of the investing world, unfortunately, works. I find them like the the wrong investors in any company. Like I look at like, and if you have an option as a founder, look for people who are not investing in your company because other people are investing in a company, which is the majority of them, by the way. Uh, you know that they want to invest in a company because they sincerely believe in your opportunity, irrespective of other other you know other investors chasing you, etc. 
and because the the nature of the startup is that things will invariably go bad at some point or some like some hard times will happen and people are not really believers in you or your company you know they will it will become you know much much harder in hard times because of that because they didn't fundamentally believe in it they just chased you because this was the hard thing you know your company was hot or your category was hot or your market was hot at that point but they didn't really fundamentally believe in it and that's what i look at like you know the one major criteria for most people to follow is like find those those investors who sincerely will believe in you your company your opportunity your market etc right how do you assess that is it is it just in the conversations and getting a feel for how deep of a knowledge base they have in the category or how long they've been thinking about it yeah, or like how much research they've done in the category how much uh, knowledge they have you know can they tell you about something like you know than than others I'll tell you, like you know um uh, my partner at unusual ventures uh, you know when we started uh, john verion is uh i remember like when i was raising capital for abdanomics you know i was talking to a whole bunch of folks and you know john came into a, into the meeting with me you know and he pre- before i presented he he knew high level you know and he presented to me like you know their thesis on that particular on that market you know a lot of investors i was talking about like you know why monitoring market large enough etc and he came with a thesis on why monitoring market is large and why the the first generation of monitoring kind of companies like wiley and all are not the right kind of companies for this next world and you know there is a gap here that someone needs to be and that was a presentation and thing that he had built on just for me actually he had it built before he had it like built and i was kind of sold on that like you know okay this person already believes in this market and this opportunity and kind of what we're doing so it becomes easier alignment going forward because it he already believes in that mm. so that's like you know that's a that's a good test in many cases i had another investor you know i was talking to who was like much before talking to much before and they were like really hard to like they said like they won't not say no but they were like just dragging me forever and you know one, then one i had like you know uh two or three term sheets and offers and the guy was like oh you know now you have the once they knew that they have another offer now suddenly the interest was like so high and they just wanted to you know make an offer then and where where they had an opportunity to be the first for a long time where they didn't you know so that to me is like also a sign that you're reading like you know they are, are they really a believer in in your opportunity or they only doing it because now they now others are interested like so that it's so if you find people who believe in your opportunity your company and you that's the best because it's a, it becomes easy you said understand what kind of advisor they are going to be what did you mean by that you know that's the hardest <laughs> hardest one you know and that comes from some uh, let's say uh, experience over time and the 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 learning set comes with it what i like to you know again i have i like to create frameworks as we talked about it i think of like you know when vcs and investors are on your board right you know you, you want their advice and help and they do want to give advice and help but i i like to call them the like two dimension two dimensions to it one is the how qualified they are and second is how strong their opinions are you know and so it, you know one time so like say if you have like highly highly qualified and you have very strong opinions still you know still still great if you have like you know high, if you're not as qualified and you have very strong opinions that's really bad situation to be because now it's like you know the, the investor has a lot of control in the company normally you know they have the you know uh, board seats and voting rights and all kind of controls right and you know now as a founder you are almost like you know that's you someone who is not really that qualified and they hold very strong opinions you are in a very you know strange place with that right so i look at like you know it's, uh, the, the you have the other category where like you know someone who's uh, you know uh, strong very qualified but like still like you know softer opinions they they are great as well you know those are probably the best ones and you know you have the you have the other category which is like you know you're not very qualified and you have soft opinions and that's all fine too because you know you're not at least being disruptive because you can bring other board members and other advisors around you to me the worst are the people who are not very qualified and very strong opinions which is common in the vc world primarily because you know the venture world is the dynamic of the venture world is like you know a few successes and people grow a lot of egos you know so the egos get very high you know the egos very get the higher your egos get your your opinions get stronger and if you are not very qualified and your opinions get stronger then you become a sort of a bad advisor in the board right so that's that's what i was trying to uh, make the point in that case like you know if you can figure out like you know what is their advice style like is it like you know that they this is my point of view and opinion and i'm in the board and you know if you you, you have to listen to me as a uh, and in you know, a very strong opinion then you better find someone who is like very 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 qualified for it 
you know, otherwise you want people who have like, you know, softer style of giving opinions. I want to pull out a nuance in there is that um, qualification as you're defining it doesn't necessarily just mean successes or experience there. That oftentimes you can be fooled by just because they were associated with a successful company early on and they saw that journey doesn't mean that they're qualified to weigh in on the inputs into yeah, your company. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, how do you how do you judge someone is qualified to to give you an advice or not? And I convert down to a very simple question now. Like, would I have this person in my board if they were not investing? You know, if if you have like you know, if the answer is yes, like you know, and this for a variety of reasons, like you know, this person was maybe a former founder who I respect, or maybe a very seasoned investor that I respect, you know, in, involved in great companies or thought leadership in the market that I respect or like, you know, or or like, you know, uh, that would you take this person as a, to be in your board or in some way involved in your company if they were not an investor? If you meet that criteria, then you are in the, then, you know, then you are in the, that, that, that bucket. And that's to me is very important. Like, you know, uh, if you want to give someone so much control in your company as an investor, you, you, you know, uh, and you want to find the people who would be there or you find people who are their style is not like, you know, dictating their opinions on you. Right. So that's 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 um, that's important. You know, it's, it's kind of nuanced to it. But when I look at like, you know, the investor founder conflicts and dramas and all that will happen on ha- happen later on, the root of that comes down to, uh, to, to, to this particular area. Anything you would add to that now besides call you first uh, <laughs> uh, uh, six years after you, know, you wrote the I, post? You know, it's a good question. Like after six years, I wrote this framework 2017, right? I would say, yes, there is one thing I would add to it, which is the stage appropriateness. And that's very, very important in the when you pick the right investor. Like what stage your company is, because the help you need in different stages is very different. It's almost like, you know, kind of like a like having a doctor. A doctor for babies is different than a doctor for, you know, when you're for, when a grown-up versus when you're like, you know, you're, when you, if you're trying to, you know, uh, get help with cancer. So I do think that stage appropriateness element is important. Like, you know, if you're starting a company, you need help on the very early stages of company building, like going from the zero to a million dollars. You know, and if someone is very, very experienced on the later stages and they're very, very good on the later stages, are they the right investor for you in that stage, right? So that you know that that part is important. But otherwise, what happens is like you know you get investors you know who are not really the right fit. You know they're maybe they will be would have been great fit for when you are early, or would be great fit when you are late in the in your in your in your in a few years down the line when you need the help and the advice now, right? So I think that's that part is important. And you know we uh, you know I'll, 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 uh, uh, we talk a lot about that on user ventures as well, like which is the the you know when you have to build of the that kind of mindset like you know then we if where are you fo- focused on you know what is the help we can provide at what particular stage hmm. right so you know and founders have to pick that because that's when they get the most specialized help uh, that that they need i want to shift gears a little bit and go to the uh, to the apti story but can you give me the background of you all the way up, not your whole life story, but just leading to the founding of Apti. So you were born in India and then moved over to the States when? Yeah, I was born in India, did my, you know, uh, went to study computer science in um, IIT, Indian Institute of Technology, the, the top engineering schools in India. And I was like fascinated by Silicon Valley. I was like, you know, at that time, the Indian startup ecosystem was almost non-existent or very, very, very early. What year is this? This was uh, year 2000. Got it. Uh, so I was you know silicon valley is the place to come let's let's go here and i started you know where, where i learned my numbers game kind of thing let's apply to a whole bunch of startups and someone will will you know will hire me and i started applying to a lot of startups from india and i, I got into a got in silicon valley as a, as a startup because that's what i wanted to work in and that i wanted to work in a you know silicon valley startup and learn the startup startup did itself. you have any exposure to it as a kid like how'd you even know was it you just know, i had a a lot of exposure to, I would call it like a mom and pop startup concept. And almost, I, I grew up in a small town in India. And my dad had a, had a like a business selling, like, you know, uh, uh, ladies bags, you know. He had another business selling irrigation machinery. Like, these are like small startups, like, you know, small sure. businesses. And almost all my family members, like, you know, uh, uncles and, you know, cousins and all were kind of in these small businesses because they were not too much other things to do so there's a lot of so I, I had a lot of exposure on the small businesses and I was when I was a kid you know starting when I was like maybe six seven years old 
after school or weekends you will go to the shop and help your dad so i kind of learned a lot of the small business thing there so you know it wasn't a st- startup in the tech startup sense but they were like these small businesses that i was exposed pretty much as a, as a, as a kid uh, and when i went then done engineering and i almost like you know just you know i feel like you know i just that's what i always wanted to do like can i bring the uh, bring the the business and the engineering side together and that's where like the, the tech startups and silicon valley and all of that just fascinated me so much so i was like let's pack the bags and and come here you know and uh, i started applying for jobs and you know one of the companies was like you know if you can we can sponsor your visa if you you can come here and i went to my dad and like can you find where to pay for my flight and uh, you know you paid for the flight and i got here yeah. it, and so that was at the dot com like right in the bubble this was right before the bubble was bursting like you know i came here and the bubble was just right about bursting you know so that was the <laughs> and so that was a pretty hard time like you know it was almost like i think it's along those months it was bursting around you know almost then and um, you know and the lot of those start like the startups didn't survive there but you learn a lot you know and like you work in startups and they don't survive and they go through that kind of bubble burst hard time you know it's kind of uh, a lot of learning that happens through that and so did you bounce around uh, how did you end up at wiley uh, wiley was at that time my third startup you know i worked at two startups before as, as an engineer um, and actually it was interesting that my i was in the startup you know, company called data sweep like uh, manufacturing data intelligence kind of thing uh, excel was one of the investors and they were also invested in wiley at that time and uh, and you know i was as an engineer i was like struggling with like performance troubleshooting for our software that it was like hard to debug problems and fix things and all and while he was doing the job and i was like oh this is a great product you know and you know this is something i it, this is the area that i you know i find interesting so i you know it's, i i got it about wiley hmm. and then one of the investors made the, the connect at that time uh and then the Wiley was a was a was a great story at that time. It's a great company, you know, with a lot of good innovative innovative technology. It was acquired by CA, which is Computer Associates. For many people who don't yeah. know, for from back back in the day, it used to be one of the biggest tech companies at that time in the enterprise software space. For four hundred and fifty million or so. About yeah, three seventy five million. Three seventy five million. Uh, which used to be a big amount. Sure. At some point. That was two thousand. Uh, what year? Two thousand seven. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Uh, so that's um, um, you know it was pretty clear to me like you know the world is changing you know this was when the, you know the uh, AWS just came out and you know, so it was like everything will move into the cloud at some point uh, you know the people are building this very distributed software systems and the, the products like Wiley and the, the, all the previous uh, g- generation stuff was not really designed for the next generation also clear like you know ca computers is not where any new innovation is going to happen around this so uh, new startups have to solve this this problem in a in a in a in a big way and that's where i was like you know you know it's kind of it met my even though i didn't have a framework like that at that point it kind of met my three criteria at least that i was convinced that the market is large and it turned out to be large you know it's like even if some people didn't believe that time it was large market you know everyone has to to monitor and troubleshoot and fix problems in the code um that you know that people were struggling with it i knew it first hand because i i saw the struggle how people were the pain was real you know it wasn't like a fake pain uh like that was one of the big pain points for almost every software engineer and then i also you know knew that i could build a great uh, you know that i was very passionate about it like i i went from my previous startup to wiley because i was passionate about the domain you know i i was working on that for for quite some time and i knew that i could spend you know time and energy i knew also i had expertise on it you know maybe i didn't have business expertise but i had a lot of tech expertise on that particular area and you know that i could i could solve that so that was kind of my my conviction i i still do remember that i was still at wiley and i was pitching to vcs at that time and one of the vcs uh, was like you know hey do you really believe in this thing uh, i said yeah i do uh, you know so why are you still in your job and you know that was i was um, i don't have an answer and i slept over it and next day i quit the job is like yeah that's a good like i do believe in it so why i'm still doing my job and um, you know because you have to like put yourself in that and i i think it's a very valid question at that point like you know that the, this founder is asking us to put a lot of money and you know they're still like you know not willing to quit the job around this right? how did you end up a solo founder not by design it wasn't intentional it wasn't intentional you know it's just happened like you know i couldn't find the right founder co-founder fast enough 
you know, when things moved, you know, even though like, you know, I had 30, uh, 35 rejections and all that, but still like things moved in the, you know, in the next, in, in a few, in few months, like I quit my job, I was already kind of pitching to folks. And like, you know, after I quit my job, maybe like, uh, like uh, a couple of months, uh, things were moving. And like uh, getting offers and term sheets and the company has to get going and couldn't find, uh, you know, the, the right co-founder, you know, and there were some attempts where like, you know, almost like the, Call it the shotgun marriage kind of attempts that were actually yeah, the first offer I got from a from a VC was the that I had to get a co-founder who was a EIR at the firm who was a very qualified you know very qualified person but I had to decide to have that person as co-founder you know uh, as part of the term sheet in like two days and you know I couldn't get comfortable with that you know it's like I just like it's it's a uh, to to get get there and you know that person was very qualified became successful in his own ways in a very major way uh but i just got to a place where i didn't have co-founder but then the first person i hired was one of the you know uh one of the best engineers i know at Wiley, and you know so he could come in and you know join me here and over time he kind of like you know even though he wasn't co-founder but like you know he played a lot of the role a co-founder will play which is like you know you're you know you're someone you can you can trust and you kind of go through the the hard times together kind of, uh, you know, uh, that that kind of role. I don't advise, you know, people to, to go solo if, you know, if you can find find a good co-founder. But at the same time, like, and I won't find co-founder just for the sake of it. Because it's very important. Like, it's uh, it's, it's as important as, you know, even, uh, as, like, you know, picking the right VC, uh, you know, a VC partner to be in a board is even more important, I would say. So if you can, if you know the right person who, like, you know, who you trust, you know, the right person who uh, you you respect and admire. You know, that's what you and and you know, like the role they can bring, right? You know, and you can have your good amount of clarity on it. That's the way to go. Apti seemed to have a pretty charmed existence from the outside in. I'm sure there was a bunch of chaos in the inside, as there always are in startups. Um, any particular things that you wish i mean we've talked about a bunch of different frameworks and lessons learned along the way and all that stuff but any particular thing that that along the way you wish you knew when you were starting the business so full charm existence <laughs> that's a that's a pretty fancy word but you know i, I, I don't true. i don't, I don't think anyone has that like there's no startup i can guarantee you has charm existence from outside yes inside no one does like you know inside is always hard like you know you always have like you know from outside in the long term it looks like a big big straight line going like that like you know it's it's like you have like the day to day is, is is crazy uh but yes it it you know we i think the the core of what we had at right end of dynamics was the market was large and we were the early uh kind of early believers that the market was large like you know that people it, you know it was kind of we were in the in the earlier stages of that application observability kind of space second was our product was very 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 strong like we, we always were the, the the best product in the market we are you know we are, it was hard for people to catch up on the the product innovation that we were doing uh and then we started building the very strong sales uh, you know execution tied to it so and you know and then i always had the fundamental belief on customer success you know which uh, many people find very odd that how much i talk about customer success but that's something i was always obsessed with that the every customer has to be value get value and be successful and so it, those are the things that made it kind of easy in some ways. Like if you get those, the flywheel works with that, right? You know, that the, the market is large, so that's kind of a, you know, tailwind to begin with. You know, now you have the, you know, your product is strong and your sales are executing well and you have the, your customers are happy. The flywheel starts moving, right? You know, and then you can, you can keep growing from there. Your major competitor uh, ended up being your old boss from Wiley. I, I, any funny stories about about that? Like, because for people that don't know, Lucerne started uh, uh, New Relic, and New Relic was kind of the mid market version, and Apti was the enterprise version. Any funny stories? Yeah, if yeah. you know, it was a strong, healthy comp competition. Like, you know, so Lou, I have a lot of respect for him. He was the founder at Wiley, and he was my boss at Wiley, and he, you know, uh, so after, you know, we, you know, a lot, lot of people at Wiley had the same realization that this market is just starting. You know, this, there's a lot of people building mo these modern distributed apps and things moving in the cloud and, you know, you know, next generation solutions to it. And so, so Lou started New Relic about a year before I started AppDynamics. And uh, he uh, he had a different thesis on a few things, you know. Uh, uh, first of all, the programming languages. You know, his thesis was the 
uh, the, the modern programming languages like Ruby, etc., will become more dominant. And uh, and they were growing very fast, and they become pretty pretty, pretty popular uh, there. Uh, and um, uh, that you could you know you don't need salespeople. He had a strong thesis on on that as well at initial early on. Uh, and you know he was a great mentor and advisor to me as well. So when I started Abdanmix, actually we didn't think it would be competitive because we had a very different uh, you know thesis on like you know that the yes the the new languages like Ruby etc. Are, are getting in popularity, but a lot of large enterprise still codes in Java. And there's a lot of pain points in Java, so I wanted to focus on Java. So we actually had initially, you know, he was, you know, it's kind of most, a lot of people don't know, he was for the very, you know, for the first, when I was just quitting my job and starting, he was advisor to, hmm. to, to Abdanomics, you know, because we didn't think it was, uh, you know, that will compete. People will be like, you know, okay, he was building for Ruby, uh, you know, and I was building for Java. And, you know, I knew that Java was, was more large enterprise, so I need to build more to sell into enterprise and figure that out. And he knew, like, Ruby was more, this kind of younger tech company, so he wanted to build a go-to-market model around that as well, which actually didn't really need salespeople. So we actually starting started like that, but you know, oh, a few years down the line, you know, they, you know, you know, uh, if you're if you're good companies, you figure out where the the opportunities are, and they start to converge, right? The market start to converge invariably. So we it did uh, start to converge, and we we had a very strong, healthy competition for a, for a long time, you know, and we 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 became very good at what our strength was, which is like you know. Selling for very complex, uh, you know, applications in in larger companies, larger environments, you know, Java, .NET, those kind of programming languages. New Relic became very good at like you know selling into SMB, high velocity languages like you know Ruby and PHP, etc. So you know, it's, it's, um, and both became successful in in, in 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 a major way. There's this now legendary story about selling the business to Cisco while uh, employees were already in New York for the IPO stock listing. Um, so can, can you tell that story, but then also, how do you come to the decision to sell? Uh, I'm sure it's a emotional and financial decision. So what were the inputs into that? Yeah, I'll start with the story. I think many people might have heard that before. It's, it's you know, we were go, about to go public. A lot of people ask me, what are you doing a dual track uh, for your IPO versus acquisition? And I tell them, there's no dual track. We were just doing IPO. And we had IPO plan for, you know, this was um, February of 2017. And uh, Thursday of that week, uh, of one of the weeks there, and uh, Cisco came in a few days uh, before, uh, before, and you know they made an offer, and um, I'll go back to the decision process. They made our the, the the first offer, you know we said no to, and then they made the second offer, we said no to, and then they made a third offer, and we said you know yep, so be like we should have to do it. Uh, but we had like you know the for IPO we planned on that we'll take our like you know mostly our first. Uh, 20, 30 employees, and some of the people have played a big role in the in the over over the time as well. So like in about 40 employees or so who will go to 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 Nasdaq and will ring the bell and do an IPO. And most of these people, you know, uh, they're very obviously very it's a very proud moment, exciting moment. And you know, most of them are engineers. You know, and most engineers don't have a suit. Uh, you know, as you know, and they're like you know people were oh I'm gonna they got a suit made for the IPO and everything was planned there <laughs> and they were in in Wall Street in uh, in New York for that. And we announced our our uh, that we are getting acquired like uh, like less than 24 hours before that IPO moment, and all these people were were like in New York for the IPO, and uh, again we are selling the company for like pretty good amount, 3.7 billion dollars, and they, everyone was sad that you know what about my suit like you know yeah. I just got it for the IPO and I think had, Nasdaq yeah. had like cupcakes and stuff with their logos yes, on yes. it and all that yeah. yeah you know so actually the good thing was uh, um, we were able to make a deal with Cisco, so Cisco has a big cloud on on Nasdaq. So we made a deal with them on like you know hey can you if we close the deal with you, can you still go and ring the bell on on Nasdaq, and you know they did their work and like you know once the deal was closed like two three months later, we actually did go back and did ring the bell and did the same kind of thing, but so which was uh, you know which, which was which was a good moment. And so so the decision the inputs into the decision I mean obviously you said no twice yeah. and I think a big, if you think about like you know, who are the stakeholders in uh, in in deciding if to sell the company or not you obviously have the founders you know in in, in Abdanmik's case I was the only founder you know you have the uh, the board and mostly investors let's say like you know your majority uh, who are, who own majority of the the company. And then you have employees who have like you know put in the all the hard work in building the company, and they all shareholders, and they all have a lot of lot of lot of input. So at certain price, uh, you know, it makes sense for all stakeholders. At certain price, it doesn't, right? You know, the uh, for for some stakeholders. So as you know, when I looked at as founder, for me, it didn't you know? So 
if we went IPO, we would have went uh, gone IPO around. Our initial pricing was like 1.4, 1.5, 1.4 billion dollars, and we would have gone through like you know kind of the normal that you know the interest was very high, so you know you know repriced it higher to go to go you know around 1.6 uh, or so. Uh, and you know the Cisco offer initially was kind of like you know not too far off off from there, and it makes sense like you know why won't we go public and uh, and uh, you know if we go public and 1.6 billion you know it's uh, we will we will will take that chance, and you know the final offer was 3.7 billion dollars right so which was more than uh, you know uh, which is about two and a half x of what we would have gone IPO with, and would have taken us you know a couple of years uh, you know at least to build towards towards that like you know. All the market valuations change and all, but let's assuming the 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 multiples and all stayed the same. So you start looking at like what's the risk, uh, you know, in going forward from here, like you know, three years from now, uh, you know, do you take that or not? What is the right thing for the for the stakeholders involved? You know, it, uh, personally for me as a founder, at some point it doesn't make really a difference from the from a financial perspective. Like it's still, you know, in both outcomes are are, are financially uh, only great. so many beach houses you can yeah, have, yeah, right? Kind of, yes. So it, it seems really... like you're still working anyway, which uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, because beach houses can get boring after some time. Yes. If you're too much on the, in there, but then you know you have the investors, you know, and investors have different opinions on that, and then you have the you know the employees, and you know we it was it was pretty hard. The it was like a three days of process, like you know back and forth, decision making. We were all holed up like in you know, a three days. People probably had like two hours of sleep in three days, you know, in, in getting all this done, and um, it's it's a hard decision. It's a very bittersweet decision, also. Like you know, it's like do you end the journey? Do you continue? Do you sell the company or not? You know, no one is. Uh, at the same time, it is like very like it's a great outcome financially for everyone. You know, we had 400 plus employees who made more than a million dollars. You know, so it's a it's a financially very life changing outcome for a lot of people. People made like you know tens of millions of dollars as well. Uh, but it's, it's it's there's no easy answer to it. Like you know, I was really really sad when it closed. Like I can tell you that you know you're celebrating. We had a big celebration party, and you come home from the celebration party and you're kind of depressed. You know, because it's like kind of the end of a you know end of end of the journey in some in in many ways. Uh, no easy way to do it, but I would say like you know you have to look at like what's the risk profile, what's the what happens for the next few years. Uh, also, like how do you you know your business well? You know where the the gaps and challenges were. We had some gaps and challenges that that you know that we knew, you know that would made it would have made it harder. Uh, but at the same time, in hindsight, the market actually exploded after that. Yeah. You know, and the the and uh, business you know Cisco did a good job with the with, with the with, with the, the acquisition for the first few years. You know, after that, it becomes like you know uh, becomes a bit different. Uh, would have been valued much more actually over time. Yeah. So like it's now if you look back like you know five six years later. Was it the right thing or to do or not? But I do think at that time it was the right thing for all shareholders. Was there a specific conversation you had along the way, or like an input? You you referenced the four hundred plus people making a million dollars that that really swayed you, or was it yeah, just? I think that was the biggest uh, point for me. Like you know, it's like I have four hundred employees who can make a million plus here. You know, we are getting a value that's like you know it will take us three to four years to grow into that valuation, and. Um, so you know, do we take a chance with like you know all this financial impact that all the employees are going to get now or not, right? And like yes, we could have gone public and you know and taken the chance in the public market for the next three four years, and that was really to me the biggest factor on on, on deciding that. I want to get your quick takes on the current state of the markets uh, and where we are today. So um, you you've you're operating two companies as we referenced, Traceable and Harness. You've had to raise a bunch of money throughout the cycles for both. What's your perspective on the current state of the technology market, the venture landscape, all that stuff? You know, I, I have a point of view which is a little bit different than many people. I feel is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a great opportunity and actually a pretty good thing, the current state of the, the markets. You know, we all got, the, in the tech world, we all got, let's say, a bit too sloppy because there was so much money easily available. The valuations were too high, money was so cheap, interest rate was low, you know, all of that stuff. And companies were not really executing well. And I will start with, like, even my own companies, like, you know, uh, you know, Abdanomics, as I mentioned, like, you know, was, uh, was kind of gone through that fire test in the 2008 recession. Uh, you know, I started AppDynamics in March of 2008, and we raised our round, etc. at that time, like, you know, uh, uh, about $5 million. In September 2008, the big crisis happened, and, you know, it, like almost like 2009 and 10 were, like, just really, really bad for any kind of fundraising. So it was really clear, like, at that time, like, you know, we need to, like, 
operate in a very very strong discipline you know focus on the core areas you know focus on like you know that your product has to be very strong so you can uh, reduce the cost of sales you know you have to you know don't do things that like you know don't matter you know do things that you know create good amount of efficiency and that became the core foundation of how web dynamics was built but the money was so easy and cheap in like the you know in the, the, the for many years after that like you know in the the last four or five years before the or this correction that it creates the company's culture in a in not the best way and including i've seen that even in my own companies as well like you know you just don't have any pressure to to operate in the most uh, optimal efficient way so i think this is a great opportunity that this is happening and this correction is happening and you know it's so strange like you know you can pretty much op- you know operate the same out- deliver the same outcome with significant lower cost and you know much highly efficient kind of model if you pay attention to it and the money was so cheap no one was paying attention to it you know so which is kind of unhealthy to me like you know as a as a company like most companies are not doing any profits and cash flows and you know even as a public company you'll be like five years seven years you're not cash flow positive and so it's it's a great opportunity in that sense mm. obviously there's a lot of bad outcomes that come with it like there's a lot of pressure with the in the you know with the to the employees you know layoffs and job cuts and you know the the startups not re- being able to raise capital you know, all of that those those things are there i really think those are also not necessarily bad like we need to get to a right balance because we got into as an industry we got into a too too craziness there uh you know the in a lot of startups that were getting funded and getting started and going probably didn't need didn't need it to be so we have a more uh, kind of the more let's say the real capitalism of tech we see silicon valley kind of model that that how it's all started like you know you you fight and compete and the the good ideas and the good execution and the good uh, good companies uh, uh you know make it into it and they generate a lot of uh, profits and value and all that and we were starting to kind of dilute down on that too much so i i you know i, I personally i feel like you know it's 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 a, it's a, it's a good thing in the long term short term we go through obviously a lot of pain you have a .ai on one of your companies uh, traceable.ai and then harness i think is leveraging artificial intelligence as well what do you think about the, that market and that opportunity you know ai is massive no, you can't can't deny it in any ways you know one thing i like to you know so at harness we launched a lot of uh, generative ai uh, capabilities for for you know software development life cycle you know how do you do deployments and testing and everything and people will say oh you know you're on the ai bandwagon as well It's okay you should look at when we launched harness in the market you know 5 years ago 5 years ago when we launched in the market we were the first one to bring ai into devops at that time you know it's like the uh, you know uh, i was uh, you know um, so we, like there was an article about in techcrunch about us generating uh, launching our ai now so okay look at the article 5 years ago in techcrunch when we launched the company it was also all about ai so we have been doing ai from 5 years ago not just now <laughs> and same with traceable like you know traceable is out there for like you know um, uh, 3 years it has ai in its uh, name and its fundamental technology from that then, then i am a strong believer in ai i do think it's uh, it's 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 really the next frontier of of you know how you of kind of a technology that can apply to almost any discipline so any discipline whether it's like you know developer tools or cyber security or marketing tools or sales management customer support management i do think you know ai has a strong strong potential there to make that whatever the workflow is you know anywhere from 2x to 5x better you know maybe even more you know uh, so we everyone has to leverage that you know I, i'm not a huge believer in like you know generic ai for, at least for the startup but i feel like you know ai for for a purpose for like for the, whatever the workflow you want to the problem you want to solve that's massive and you every company should do it one of the things that i think you'll agree with is uh given especially that you're working still despite uh uh not needing to after the success of app dynamics is not living your life uh Or, or not not spending your time to then go live your life and working towards some end and not enjoying the the journey along the way how how has that impacted you how do you sort of think about uh following your passions or or your work on a day-to-day basis and advice for anyone that's kind of thinking through their career it's always a very interesting question on on why you do what you do right uh, so after app dynamics was sold and you know i i didn't have to stay there at just go at all uh because i was uh, the the day to day responsibilities were already handed off i 
the first instinct was that I can retire now, that I don't need to do anything. I can, I, can, I should just retire. And I did retire. So, you were how old at the yeah. time? I was uh, like uh, early 30s. Yeah. Retire as in like, you know, let's do things that, you know, actually I was putting things on hold when I was doing AppDynamics. Right? So I had like, you know, a big uh, bucket list of things that I need to go safari in Africa and I need to hike in the Himalayas and Bhutan and I need to hike Machu Picchu and I want to, you know, see the fjords in Norway and uh, I had a whole list. And it's okay, let's just do it. And like six months, the whole list was done. You know, it's just, but it was great six months. You know, six months of my bucket list was done at that time. And I was like, okay, what next? Like, am I really going to be like this? And this is what really put away. And I, I, what I realized that I enjoyed the, the abdominal journey. It wasn't the means to an end to just do the, that what I'm doing. Like, I actually really enjoyed that. That's what I want to do. Like, that's what I, I like the, the, you know, kind of the, 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 the tension of, uh, of operating, you know, uh, competing in the market and building good products. And uh, it's like, it's that's what I enjoy. And that's when I started looking at like, you know, I need to not think about like, you know, what's that this is a this is an outcome to something, but I, st- I need to do it because this is what I enjoy. But I like to build frameworks, right? So obviously I, ha- you know, I have to have a framework for something like this. So I, I put a very simple, thing, okay, l- like, let me l- list down like, you know, let's say, you know, 10, 15 years from now, what would I look back? What would I look at? Like, you know, I did all the things I wanted to do, right? You know, and you know, the, obviously I, I want, because one thing I, I decided that I cannot do, that let's do things. And once you achieve those things, then you do something else. Let's try to do a balance of everything. Like, so which includes like, you know, fun, family, you know, friends, you know, your intellectual challenge of work you know what you what what you like to do you know uh anything that you want to do like you know can i get a healthy balance of doing it and that's what i look at people say you're running three things and you know or two companies full time and you know venture capital and everything do you ha- do you, how do you balance anything do you have time for everything i i said i do actually because that's how i like to manage it and uh because i, I if i'm committing to this for the long term this is what i would like to do and you know, i might be doing this job that i do for who knows like my whole life uh i can't put things on hold on other other parts of the life right you know a few things you can like you know actually i put a list and i said okay there may be one or two things i can put on hold but not 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 nothing else like you know uh, i i was very interested in philanthropy but you know i decided that for me to need really go deep into it i need to put on hold that one like you know that i will deal with 10 years later uh but everything else i was able to to balance but i do think that's very important at some point like you have to do what you you know to be Nothing wrong with like, you know, working for the end, like, you know, let's say you you have a passion that doesn't produce too much money. Uh, and so you want to work in a job that will produce money. So you have to do a passion. That's that's also fine. But if you can find something where like, you know, what you're passionate about and what you enjoy can give you the lifestyle and the, the you know, things that you need, that's, uh, you know, then it's then it's great. And if you have already the, the lifestyle and the, the money and all that you need, then it's great also because you can continue to do what you're, you're passionate about. So. I, I, for me, the driver on always is being good at what you do. I like the, you know, that kind of just that mindset of like, you know, if I want to be an entrepreneur in this space, I want to be very good at my craft. That's my craft. Like that's, you know, okay, like, you know, if I want to be uh, investor fully, I want to be good at my, that craft, like whatever the craft is, you want to be good at your craft and kind of the view to be good at that craft, you have to enjoy it. You know, there's no way like, you know, if you want to be really good pianist, you have to enjoy playing piano. If you are doing it just to to an end means to an end you're not gonna be never be you know if you want to be great at you know uh, playing basketball you have to enjoy playing basketball you can't just be doing it for the you know the you know that it's a uh, it means to some kind of end right so i'm i'm i feel i feel happy i feel fortunate that i found that this is what i, I like you know sometimes it, i f- there are times when i feel uh, i made a mistake you know that's the that's crazy <laughs> and do i really enjoy it you know but you know those those are bad days as you know in in the world of startups and things you know impossible to not have bad days but in general i i think like you know it's it's good to find something you enjoy well Jyoti, thank you for doing this this was great i uh amazing frameworks and uh yeah inspirational to see you execute on this job that you're you're done being an outside observer on the app dynamics path and then now harness and traceable and and unusual so thank you for doing this great to be here and catching up also